Hi, we're going to talk about Rilke and Kafka today. And um, these two writers came from a similar milieu. They were both from Prague. They were born at the end of the 18th century, not the 18th century, the 1800s. And um, they are both important contributors to existentialist literature. Now, I don't know, some of you, I'm sure I've taken a few like English classes, etc. But if that's not you know, your background or whatever. You might feel a little bit nervous about reading this kind of thing because you can get into a situation where you're asking yourself, am I interpreting this correctly? And um, I, I just want to emphasize that, it, and this is especially true for Kafka, that they are very open to interpretation. There's not, it's not like a, a puzzle that you're supposed to, or a riddle you're supposed to figure out the answer to. There's, there's uh, multiple interpretations. Now, um, with Rilke, let's take a look at notes from, uh, the, excuse me, the notes of Malta Lourdes Briga. Now, this is sort of like a, an autobiographical um, sketch. Uh, he, he referred to it sometimes as uh, notebooks of my other self. And um, he's talking about his experience uh, living in Paris in 1910. And I mean, of course, it's fictionalized somewhat, but it t deals with those themes of like alienation in the urban modern, modern at the time world. And I, I think you can see some commonalities between this and uh, Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground. Um, he talks about topics like death and the passage of time and just uh, being a somewhat isolated individual in an urban environment. Okay, so and when he's talking about the hospital as mass-produced death, um, he, he uh, wants to emphasize the, the importance of individuality even in the way that we die and that the modern world doesn't really allow for that. And this isn't in the part that was in the, the Kaufman reading, but um, in the, the book itself, he talks about his grandfather's death and how it was like huge and loud and everybody in the village knew about it. And to me, again, that sort of echoes what um, Dostoevsky was talking about when he, in the in the notes from, from Underground about the, you know, complaining about the toothache. You want everybody to be like in on your pain and to be aware of just how much you're suffering. Um, I want to talk just briefly about this uh, little snippet about the third person. And there's at least two ways to interpret it. You know, one is the third person, like he, she, it, third person. And and there you can kind of connect it to, to Buber, who talks about, you know, I, the first person, and you or thou, the second person. And the third person is kind of the removed perspective, the supposedly objective perspective. So you could interpret uh, Rilke in this way, that he's saying, like, we we want to look at things from an objective distance, you know, so instead of looking at the, the genuine experience, we want to look at it sort of like ossified into something that's in the past. Or you could think about it as like a literal third person, like there's this couple and in a lot of uh, like dramatic storytelling, you know, there's got to be some kind of conflict. There's got to be somebody who comes in and, and you know, uh, produces some, some disharmony between that uh, those two people. And and um, I think one of the things Rilke wants to say is the the dynamic itself between two people in a relationship is fascinating all in and of itself. You don't need to add this like extra drama, some sort of jealousy or intrigue or whatever, that it's, uh, you know, just just what goes on between two people, the conflict and the... the um, the bond that exists there is by itself uh, fascinating, and we tend to mm, not focus on that because we want we want we want some drama. We want we want intrigue. Okay, um, when he's talking about God, when he talks about uh, this is part of a passage in the notebooks where he's saying like maybe we've never really seen things as they truly are, you know, like what should we do about that? And um, so so maybe we, we're not even getting to the surface of things, even the surface of things is obscured. 
um, let alone seeing things in depth. And, and then he, he makes this really interesting analogy about um, comparing God to like a pocket knife, you know, so like if you if you give a kid a, a pocket knife, you know, he's gonna use it and dent it, get fingerprints and dirt and stuff on it. It's going to reflect uh, the ways that it's been used. And, and he asked that question about, you know, our, our, our God, our, or our different concepts of God is like, do, do they bear the impression of uh, the way that we use, use God? And that made me think of some of his poems from the Book of Hours. So the Book of Hours is you know, basically love poems to God, right? And um, I, I included a couple of excerpts from poems from the Book of Hours that talk about the relationship with God and what I think is is so interesting about them is the, the sort of intimacy and personal nature of the relationship with God and this particular line let everything happen to you beauty and terror just keep going no feeling is final you might if you saw Jojo Rabbit that was uh, a cap that was uh, included in, uh, in that film um, and then this you God who live next door. I mean, again, that's really capturing that idea that that Buber presented of the I thou relationship with God. Um, in any case, I want to just spend a little time talking about um, his his neighbor Nikolai Kuzmich. You know, this guy who's trying to hold on to time, right? So he's trying to give himself the gift of time and hold on to it. And he gets to a point where, you know, he's so aware of the passage of time that he can actually feel the movement of the earth. And that reminded me of a passage in in Camus' The Plague, where he talks about like how to not waste one's time, you know, and gives examples of all these things that, that make time really drag on, you know. So I think that's kind of like there's a couple of things here to think about. Uh, one is this, uh, there's this kind of dilemma of human existence. Like we, we, our time is so precious. We want to hold on to it, um, but we can't. Um, but then too, the idea that the passage of time is so subjective, right? So when you're doing something that's, that's boring or you're waiting for something to happen, time just drags on. Now you might seem like if you want time to to, to last, you know, you should be doing the things you least want to do, you know, just miserably passing your time. Uh, so that's, that's again, a kind of like a, a paradox of existence. The more you, that you are enjoying yourself, the more you're, that you're living in the present, the faster your time will pass. Okay. And then briefly that last uh, snippet in the, the readings where he talks about um, you know, trying to get a sense of your true self, that, you know, we're always wearing some mask and we can never fully take that off, you know, that we're, we're always playing a role, even when we're by ourselves. And um, I think that that's, again, you know, in keeping with a lot of the existentialist themes of authenticity and the, the constant challenge of authenticity. Um, I want to turn to Kafka now, just briefly. Um, so uh, Kafka probably, I mean, you're familiar with him, even if you haven't read his work. Um, and he's known for, for creating these, these incredibly evocative situations where a person is kind of like trapped in, in a Usually it's, it's a, a confrontation with some kind of bureaucracy where there doesn't seem to be any solution. So again, uh, as with uh, Rilke, you can see some, some um, central existentialist themes being re reflected in Kafka's writing. One, and again, we'll see this, of course, with Camus later, is the, the sense of absurdity. Like, what I'm doing seems to be so pointless. There's no end to it. Uh, there's no resolution to it. And the rules don't make any sense, right? Um, and then also the sense of individuality. This is something Rilke talks about. Out, but there are uh, aspects of this in in each of the parables uh, of Kafka that we're looking at um, and as I mentioned before the focus on bureaucracy and I think you can take bureaucracy as a metaphor right um, 
for you know just dealing with life but you can also kind of think of bureaucracy in a more literal sense that you know when we're talking about alienation in the modern world one of the features of this modern world that can lead to so much alienation is dealing with bureaucracy right and i'm sure this is true for you as students when i was in um in college, you know, that was the, the worst part of, of my life was dealing with, you know, registering for classes and getting financial aid and, and all that kind of garbage. And again, it was it was a, a more like you had to stand in a lot of lines in those days. You know, my, my sister would describe it as, oh, I have to go down to the financial aid office and cry so I can get my money for this semester because she would always wind up crying, waiting in line, dealing with this endless bureaucracy just to be able to get the funding to be able to go to school for that semester. And she thought like, well, that's the purpose. They have to just get you to the point where you cry and then they'll give you the money. Um, I, I hope it's not that way still today, but uh, uh, that's definitely a frustrating aspect of student life. Okay, so uh, the first parable, an imperial message. Now I'm not gonna just try to say like, this is the point of this story, because again, I think that there's not a single interpretation that is the, the correct one, the one that Kafka intended you to figure out. Um, but the idea is though, so there's this emperor and he gives a message to his messenger. And um, it's important. It's specifically for you, right? And that's the way it's framed in the story. It's for you, uh, the reader. And, um, you know, he asks the messenger to whisper it back to him. So it's an important message specifically for one person. And the messenger has to go through these throngs and throngs and throngs of people for literally thousands of years, right, to try to get to you. And there's no way that you're, that, that this messenger is ever going to make it through. But, you know, you're there waiting for this message. So I, I guess it, it, I want you to think about this. Like, what is this? suggests. I mean, first of all, what emotions does this uh, provoke? Is it um, frustration? I mean, that, that's probably the first one that comes into my mind is frustration. It's like, it's so important and it's, it's specifically for me and I, I, it's never going to get here. Um, it, but it could be also a sense of, of even hope, you know, like, well, I know that there is something, there really is something out there. And, you know, even if I never see it, I, I know it exists, right? Um, and a lot of people interpret it uh, as a, um, a parable of the relationship to God, so that that God is trying to speak to us, but that a message is never going to get through. But I think there's a variety of interpretations that you could think about in relation to that. So that's something I want to talk about when we do our discussion this week. Before the law, there's a parable and then there's a discussion of the parable. Now the parable itself is older than um, the trial, which this, this whole section is from. Um, so he published that, that parable by itself independently and then the, the later discussion between Joseph K. and the priest that's included in, in the book, The Trial, which was published posthumously and against Kafka as well. All right, so um, the parable is about a, a man standing before a door trying to get to the law, and there's a, a doorkeeper who's guarding the door. And, um, you know, he, the doorkeeper won't let him in, and he says even if he did get past this door, there's innumerable other doors with even ever more fearsome doorkeepers. And basically this, this man spends his entire life waiting to get into the door, and then he asks the doorkeeper, like, well, how come I haven't seen anybody else trying to get in? So this door is meant for you only. Now, there's obviously a lot of parallels between this and the imperial message um, parable that it's something that's specifically intended for one individual. It's impossible, right? Um, the rules seem to be completely unclear. Like, like, why are these rules in place? How do I ever, you know, get through? Um, and the, this unknown authority uh, that's behind all this, that's something that, that the, the individual is never going to get into contact with. Now, what I think is really fascinating, and this tells something about how 
Kafka means for his parables or his stories to be interpreted is the discussion of interpretation, right? So, you know, Joseph K, he wants to interpret it in terms of right and wrong, like who's being deluded, uh, who's doing the deluded, doing the deluding, etc. And, um, you know, the priest kind of argues against that, you know, he's trying to try and say, like, there's this whole body of interpretation around this parable, and there's not a single definitive interpretation that's the correct one, right? Um, so, on the one hand, you could blame the guard, you know, the guard is deceiving the man when it, by not letting him through. On the other hand, you could say the guard is just upholding his duty, you know, he's just doing what he's supposed to do, and he's, in fact, very patient and admirable and compassionate in it. Um, and, and the guard is there at the behest not only of the law, but of that, that the individual, the man who's who's waiting to enter because, you know, if it weren't for that man there, you know, he, he doesn't have any job to do. Um, and the man is free to come and go. He chooses not to, but that is his personal choice, right? So, um, Joseph K. seems to be frustrated by the, the these possibilities of interpretation, and he's like, "What do you mean? Uh, the world order is based on a lie?" And, and and again, it's not presented as though this is the only possible interpretation, but this is a possibility. Um, and and so you say, "Well, look at the whole thing. What's it meant to?" suggest is it about the law specifically that we we seek the law but none of us can actually get true justice in the world okay um and and i don't think it is just from a sense of like a social perspective of of the law uh of the laws of society but a, a deeper sense of of justice or fairness or just some kind of comprehensible order that we're trying to understand um and, and again, this is something that I'd like you to, to think about what interpretation makes sense and what is its relevance to our lives. Um, the last parable, Couriers, this one I think is, is great because it's so short and uh, I think it can be super frustrating. You're like, wait, wait, isn't there more? Wait, I don't, there's not enough here. Um, okay, so the idea is there's all these couriers running around shouting messages, but they are not from anyone. Nobody wants to be a king. So as couriers, and again, all of these parables deal with somebody who's like the messenger, you know, the person who's carrying out the wishes of somebody else, some mysterious authority. In this case, it's explicit. There's no kings. There's only couriers. Okay. And I think the first time I read it, it was so short and I was just like, what? You know, and then now when I read it, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's so true. That is what the world is like. It's a bunch of couriers and no kings. Um, and I, I think there are multiple interpretations, but but the one that that is is most striking to me, I suppose, would be to say that this is the world that we're in. Everybody's running around proclaiming the truth. They're saying there are these uh, principles or these rules, or these these fundamental truths that we need to follow, but they're not coming from any actual authority. Everybody's trying to, to spread the word, but where the word comes from is unknown to anyone. Um, and you could interpret that uh, imaginary source as being God, but I don't think that's the only possible interpretation. You know, we have all sorts of ideas about the value of um, democracy or that we have these fundamental inalienable rights um, or these basic precepts of morality. And, and those are the messages that are being shouted, but but the, the parable really raises the question is like, where do these come from? Do these foundations even really exist? Uh, and, and that's the message that I, I take from it. But again, I'm really curious to hear your interpretations or even you could write a, a paper on, on any one of these parables or all of them taken together. Um, so uh, that's it for today. Uh, looking forward to um, hearing your, your feedback. And um, please let me know if you have any questions.